Exactly 20 years ago today, Korea's one and only international broadcaster, Arirang TV, made a great leap forward by launching overseas broadcasting for the first time. Beginning with the Asian Pacific region in 1999, Arirang TV continued to reach further into millions of viewers in all corners of the world, stretching from Europe and North America to North Africa. And now, our viewership surpassed 140 million households in 103 countries. Adidan TV also has signed MOUs with some 95 broadcasters in 57 countries, expanding mutual exchanges across the globe. Today, we look back on the past 20 years of Adidan TV and seek ways for further advancement in an interna as an international broadcaster with Dr. Kim Tae-hwan of Korea National Diplomatic Academy. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me today. You have made quite frequent contributions to Arirang TV, and you were also with us uh, marking a handful of milestone events. Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate the past 20 years of Arirang TV? Wow, 20 years in a word. Uh, well, there's no, no doubt that uh, has been, you know, pioneering the Korean international broadcasting. But then I would rather argue that it has been for the past two decades playing a role as a messenger, Korean mes messenger of Korean national identity in the international society, and particularly three uh, 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 small, small roles. The first one is uh, uh, the role of information messenger by providing, you know, uh, as we all know, by providing detailed, uh, in-depth information and in news in Korea that is very uh, important to understand uh, Korea. Uh, on the part of the international community. The second role is, uh, I would say, that it's a, a cultural messenger okay, uh, by introducing the international society to Korean culture, not simply traditional classic Korean culture, but also, you know, modern pop culture, including, you know, uh, Korean wave. That I think uh, 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 would of great help in facilitating further uh, a deeper understanding not only of Korea but also mutual understanding and, and also uh, cultural exchanges between and across uh, different countries and, and, and cultures. The third role I think is, uh, is, uh, 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 is very important, particularly uh, has an increasing importance these days as uh, 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 the role of provision uh, providing what I call uh, interpretative, interpretative uh, framework uh, by providing Korean perspectives on, on, on very important issues, not simply Korea-related issues, but also you know, regional and, and global issues. And, and this is very important in, in formulating global public opinion, okay? not only simply a, a deep understanding of Korea, the public opinion uh, formation, uh, contributing to, to the formation of uh, global public opinion. So uh, in that sense, I think uh, the, the, the role of, this is not flattery, <laughs> but the role of uh, Arirang TV has been way over and beyond simply depicting or disseminating Korean national image, or, or for that matter, Korean national brand. It's simply representing the Korean national identity per se. So we have been much more than just a messenger of what I, has been I believe so. Happening yeah. in Korea. Messenger of Korean national identity. Now, Adirang TV has also played its role in promoting peace in the region. And yeah. as part of the efforts, we hosted a special uh, panel discussion uh -huh. the day before the historic right. encounter between President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. And you were with us for that special <laughs> yes. broadcast. I was there. How yeah. did you feel about giving your analysis on inter-Korean issues I was, to I was the world? really, you know, personally very, very excited to be part of uh, the historical moment there. Uh, but then as a scholar, uh, I personally am so much interested in, in, in identity politics in, in global arena. And given the fact that all the uh, major countries surrounding Korea, including uh, United States, China, Japan, and Russia, uh, have been undergoing recently uh, very fundamental uh, change 
in, right. in national identity. Right. So seen from that uh, uh, perspective of identity politics, I actually propose that uh, North Korea was and it still is uh, at a critical juncture, meaning that standing at the crossroads between a normal country as, as national identity of North Korea, normal country and an abnormal country. That was very uh, uh, critical juncture. And my po on, on another point, from that you know, perspective, uh, my, my suggestion was that we should not have any a priori assumption about say, Kim Jong-un, Chairman Kim Jong-un's uh, genuine intention on, on North Korean denuclearization. And it really depends on how, how negotiations will, will evolve and unfold. So it, it really depends not only, not simply on Chairman Kim Jong-un, but also on Korea, South Korea for the matter, and the United States, who actually have great stake in North Korean denuclearization and if we also take part in the very tangible uh, uh, specific negotiation process. And then the process we all know that is still on the way. Now that's my uh, contention <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> we shouldn't jump to dangerous conclusions or make no. dangerous assumptions. No. Well, we definitely no. always have that on our minds when we report sure. news. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, most countries are investing a lot on fostering state-run global international broadcasters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about the importance of fostering an international broadcaster and how other countries are doing on that front? Okay, first of all, we have to be aware of the fact that, that uh, there has been rapid, uh, radical change in the market, if I could use the term market here or field, if you like, of international broadcasting. What I mean by radical change in the, in, the, in, the, in the field of international broadcasting, there's no longer a monopoly of international broadcasting by a couple, handful of Western countries, meaning that there's an increasingly, the international broadcasting is increasingly pluralized. We have witnessed, particularly since the end of Cold War, the emergence of non-Western international broadcasters, such as uh, Qatar's uh, Al Jazeera, right. Russia's uh, Russia Today RT, and China's CCTN, uh, Singapore's uh, Channel News Asia, uh, Venezuela's Telesur, and uh, Saudi Arabia's Al Arabiya. All those, I mean, including of course uh, Iran TV. <laughs> uh, so. There's a, what does that mean? I mean, previously, before the pluralization of international broadcasting failed, international broadcasting served as a sort of like an instrument of countries' unilateral public relations, particularly in the early 20th century, as an instrument of uh, imperialist uh, public relations. In the Cold War era, instrument of uh, you know the communist or capitalist uh, uh, public relations but that's no longer the, the case okay, we have very you know uh, harsh competition all those non-western as well as western you know international broadcasters they competitively disseminate propagate their own views ideas values in the form of stories their own stories narratives so some people argue that it's, uh, we now see witness in the international broadcasting market a sort of like information war or discourse war or battles for, for, for values and ideas. But I, I would say that uh, there is a, a very you know, tough competition between and among those you know, old and new international broadcasters for soft power. This is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, very important narrative, national stories, national uh, 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 discourse, uh, very important source of uh, 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 salt power. So these days, it's, it's even said that the, the power depends not only on whose army wins, but also increasingly, it also depends on whose story wins. This is better for stories, better for stories. So in, in that sense, I, I would argue that international broad 
broadcasting is, is now a field venue of, uh, you know, not necessarily in bad sense of the term, a competition for soft power. Now, times have changed, as you've mentioned, and broadcast is not the same as we know it mm -hmm. 10 or 20 years ago. Now, different media platforms offer a wide range of options for users to obtain information. And more and more people are turning to mobile devices as their <laughs> yes. primary medium. Now, in your opinion, what significant role should an international broadcaster play in this ever-changing world? Well, that's a very tough question, but then uh, digital media, social media is, is, uh, uh, is particularly a challenge. I mean, a very uh, grave challenge to international, the, the conventional international uh, broadcasting. It's a double-edged sword. On the, on the one hand, uh, uh, it, it, the, the digital revolution, digital media contributed a lot to democratization of information and news, but at the same time, uh, we see a uh, what, they, what, what they call uh, the, the paradox of plenty, meaning that we have a plethora of sources of news and information, but at the same time, the attention of viewers, audience is very scarce. So everybody uh, in cyberspace, uh, all the new media, they, they actually uh, running after attention of audiences. So comes sensationalism. So comes we have uh, uh, disinformation, misinformation, even outright fake news. Right. So it is said that we are living in a sort of like a post-truth era in which opinions rather than fact prevail. Opinions rather than fact prevail. That's the, the reality. So, what is the role of the international broadcasting then in, in this, you know, multi post truth year? Uh, I believe that uh, the international broadcasting should leave, paradoxically, uh, an anachronic life, abiding by the old rules of the game, meaning that sticking to hard fact, sticking to truth, so should live in truth era in an era of post-truth that I think is a very important uh, fact we have to remember, keep in mind as, as international broadcasters. Now, we're witnessing dynamic changes in the region, and Arirang TV at the beginning of the year has declared it will become the representative broadcaster in Northeast Asia. What do you think are some of the biggest strengths of Arirang TV? Why, why simply Geographical scope is, uh, is confined and limited. No East Asia. Why not East Asia for that matter? Why not, you know, Asia? I think uh, we should be more ambitious. But anyhow, I think uh, obviously we have a potential, uh, Iran TV has a potential uh, advantage or strength for that matter, and representing whether it's North East Asia, East Asia, or, or, or Global Asia. The thing is that... Uh, the biggest strengths of Arirang TV? Credibility. Okay? Uh, credibility is very important, and particularly uh, the... Uh, I would say that the, the strengths of... Uh, particularly when we compare specifics of some, some other countries' broad international broadcasters, I'm not, not blaming, you know, uh, other countries, uh, uh, international broadcasters in, in the area, in the, in the region. But then we have a very strong potential in positioning the Aryan TV as a sort of what I call a conciliatory bro uh, broadcaster in between, say, uh, uh, South Korea and North Korea in between South Korea and China, in between Japan and, and South Korea. So if we positioning ourselves as a facilitating conciliation, reconciliation between uh, the regional countries, 
that I think is, uh, is, is very uh, meaningful. And also we have, for that matter, given the historical experiences. I mean, it's really hard for, for strong countries, strong people take an a initiative and, and, and position themselves uh, in, in reconciliate, conciliate, or for that matter, like uh, peace journalism. But then South Korea, uh, I think, is, uh, is best located, uh, given the historical, you know, what we have undergone historically, is rather, you know, uh, uh, well positioned to, to, to play the role as a reconciliating, peace oriented, conciliatory uh, international broadcaster. All right, I'm afraid that is all the time we have for you tonight. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Professor Kim, for your insights. Thank you very much for uh, having me tonight. Thank you. And that does it for this edition of News In Depth. From all of us here at Arirang, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you right back here, same time tomorrow.